This is an interview on uh, April 18, 1994, with Dr. Ernest Greenwood in his home in Oakland by Francis Lomas Feldman. Uh, the purpose is to learn something about him uh, and his role in social work, the broader field of social welfare for the Social Welfare Archives. Mm -hmm. Ernie, when is it registering? Yes, you want sure? us to play it back well, and, and be sure. Uh, you know. No, where else? No. Well, Francis, what do you want to know? What I'd like that to you know. That you don't already know. Uh, but mm -hmm. you might start with some vital statistics, like when you were born. I was born. You were born. Yes, I was born in um, uh, a city in the capital of the province of Transylvania, uh, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, on December 26, 1910. And uh, my father brought the family to the United States when I was 10 years old. I celebrated my 10th birthday in the middle of the ocean, middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And we landed in New York Harbor on New Year's Eve, 1921. Now, what? Uh, tell me who was in your family. I well, met your sister. Yeah, and I have, I have another sister. Mm -hmm. She lives in uh, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. They all lived in uh, Santiago at one time, but when Allende came in, since they were fairly wealthy people, or factory owners, there was the possibility that their uh, possessions would be socialized. So they decided that they would um, leave Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, it was not socialized because Allende never got to live long enough to socialize mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But they decided... Uh, my, my sister, uh, Magda from Chile, whom you met, went to Geneva because her husband became connected with a bank. And my other sister went to Vancouver and they set up a plastics factory because that's what they had in Santiago and they've done very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, then uh, when you came at age 10 mm -hmm. to the United States, where did you... Stay? We settled in New York and uh, in Brooklyn, New York, in a Jewish neighborhood. And um, we were there, we lived there for about a year. My mother died at the, uh, during that year from, um, from um, what do you call it, pneumonia. pneumonia. In those days there was no cure for pneumonia. And my father put us into the Hebrew Orphan Asylum. And we stayed in the Hebrew Orphan Asylum for uh, two, three years. And our social worker was a woman by the name of Helen Tausig. Now, she became, her uh, aunt became very famous in social work. Did she come to Los Angeles? No, right? no, no. That's this was all in New York. Tausig. Yeah, that was a different Tausig. But Helen Tausig, her also uh, by the same name, and her aunt was head of the Jewish Family Service in uh, in New York City and became quite famous in social work. But she was a young social worker just out of the New York school and she became our social worker. And we remained friends throughout her life. Mm -hmm. Did she influence your decision? To I don't know whether that was in influential. I, I can come to that. My father remarried. Uh, in about two, three years he remarried. He met another woman, also an immigrant, whose family he knew in uh, uh, Europe. She was much younger than he, but she made us a very wonderful mother. Uh, and uh, after, uh, when uh, the family became reunited, he moved us to uh, northern New Jersey in a small industrial town called Passaic, which was a textile town. Mm -hmm. And there uh, they bought a uh, grocery store and uh, she ran the store during the day and he, he was a tailor by profession, by occupation I should say, there's a difference. And uh, uh, he worked in the various uh, 
uh, garment factories in northern New Jersey. We had large numbers of factories in northern New Jersey who were called runaway shops. They ran away from New York City because of the uh, uh, union um, uh, organizing, the uh, Ladies' Garment Workers Union and the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union. And there was plenty of work at fairly low wages, and we managed somehow. Mm -hmm. Then uh, did you have all your schooling in New Jersey? I had, uh, I, I regard Passaic, New Jersey as my hometown. I had my elementary school. I graduated from elementary school and I went to high school there. And um, that's my hometown. Mm -hmm. And from there I went uh, to Fordham University in New York City. I was going to become an attorney. <clears throat> And I used to commute because it was within commuting distance uh, from Passaic to New York. And in my, in my sophomore year, I took a course in sociology. And I was hooked. And I decided that instead of becoming an attorney, all of my friends were becoming attorneys. It just didn't seem uh, romantic enough. But sociology seemed very, very unusual. So I decided that I would become, because people would ask me, well, what can you do with it? So I decided that I would become a teacher of social science mm -hmm. and come back to my hometown and get a job because everyone knew me. The principal knew me. The superintendent of schools knew me. And I went to Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And I went there because it was a state university tuition was minimal and that year I got a fellowship from the council, Passaic County Council of Jewish Women and it was just enough to cover um, living expenses and I hitchhiked out to um, Ohio University and as I say tuition was very small I made that uh, picked it up in the summer with, uh, working as a, a waiter and that's how I was able to finish my two years at Ohio University. I got my de degree in sociology. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I got a, a minor in uh, the School of Education. I did practice teaching in a rural high school because I wanted my teaching credentials if I wanted to go back to Passaic. And I graduated in June of 1933. In March of 1933, FDR came into power. And he instituted immediately the Emer Federal Emergency Relief Administration. And uh, Ohio University was located in Athens County, Ohio. It was an anthracite mining, coal mining area. And the uh, Board of Supervisors in, in the county asked the chairman of the Department of Psychology to set up the FERA for Hawking County because he was known as a good organizer. And when he set it up, he went to the sociology department and recruited graduates from the department to become eligibility investigators. And that summer I spent the entire summer as with FERA as a an eligible as a you know as a, as a uh, relief worker, mm -hmm. and that was my first contact with uh, social work. And you decided you liked it enough to well, stay. Well, not yet, not yet. Uh, by that time, I had a fellowship. I was going to become a sociologist because my mentor said, "You you don't want to teach high school. You've got the stuff to teach uh, maybe in a small college." And they secured for me a fellowship in sociology at the University of Cincinnati at the other end of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finished my work in Hocking County in September, I went to the University of Cincinnati. And they gave me, they gave me a fellowship, a $300 fellowship, $30 a month. But one dollar a day was enough for food if you ate in the student cafeteria. <laughs> and, you were relatively rich. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to pay tuition because I had a fellowship. Mm -hmm. And all I had to do was work. They had a uh, social research laboratory. 
a, an urban research laboratory, and I worked in the urban research laboratory, and I graded papers and so forth. So far, nothing about social work. And when I finished my master's degree in 1935, they said, you shouldn't stop with a master's degree. You should go on and get a doctorate. But I was flat broke by then. And I was just... You'd spent too much money on meals. <laughs> on meals. And I was skinny as a rail. Oh, God. And um, I used to send pictures of myself back home, and they would write me long letters, eat, eat. <laughs> You're not eating enough. Uh, anyway, I finished my master's, and I decided that I had had enough for school. I had no money. The time had arrived to do some work and save some money for a doctorate. And the uh, chairman of the Department of Sociology was a very good friend of the um, uh, Court of Domestic Relations. And I got a job at the Court of Domestic Relations. The court had three divisions, divorce and alimony, juvenile delinquency, juvenile, uh, and aid to dependent children. The a ADC was under the uh, uh, under the uh, judge of the uh, uh, the uh, domestic court of relations. Mm -hmm. They used to put ADC anywhere where they can put it, mm -hmm. and I was there for four years, and in the juvenile department, and I became a juvenile probation officer, and I became very friendly with the head of the ADC section. The, the judge would sit court, uh, sit court in domestic relations two days, three days, sit court juvenile uh, relations one day, then administer the aid to dependent children's program, and he was a remarkable man. Mm -hmm. He belongs to That's the That's also a remarkable arrangement. It's a good arrangement. It's a very good arrangement because he handled all uh, adoptions and everything, all in that court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he belongs to the generation of um, Judge Ben Lindsay. Mm -hmm. He was a, an innovator and a pioneer because we had the first uh, detention home. We had psychologists uh, giving psychological tests. All the probation officers were college grads. The head of the uh, ADC program, a woman by the name of Ruth Jones, a wonderful lady, had, uh, was a graduate of SSA in Chicago and had done her field work under um, Jane Adams at Hull House. And she started working on me. Uh, she had. She was a single lady, an elderly lady, and she, her staff of social workers, uh, ADC workers, would meet at her home for parties and brunches, and I was always invited. And I got to. I, I became very comfortable among social workers. Uh, they were a wonderful, a wonderful lot. But I couldn't give up sociology. And when I had enough money. I went to Columbia University and got a doctorate in sociology. And midway, I ran out of money. And I went back to the institution where I had been a kid, because I remembered that so many of our counselors were students at the various um, schools, universities in New York. And I got a job as a resident counselor on the basis of the work that I did at the juvenile court and on the basis of the fact that I, I, I knew the workings of the institution as a kid. And um, I was a resident counselor there for uh, oh, about two, three years. I uh, wrote my dissertation there, but I did not write my dissertation on the institution. I should have. But by the, I minored in statistics at Columbia, and I wrote my dissertation in an entirely in the field of methodology. One of my one of my teachers, who was a statistician, suggested that I review the literature of sociology for the previous twenty years, and gather together all studies that presumed to use the experimental method. And I reviewed the literature, and uh, at that time, 
the experimental design was be beginning to be used everywhere because uh, uh, tests of significance uh, were developed, uh, randomization, uh, probability theory um, was being developed at that time. And he wanted me to appraise the, uh, the rigor of these experiments. And I completed the dissertation, and when I completed it, the, uh, my supervisor suggested, it was, it was quite good, he suggested that I uh, revise it for publication, that he would help me get it published. And it was published by... Where? published but it's this is an affiliate of, of uh, Columbia University Press now I'm getting off I'm getting off on a tangent this he was my mentor and he wrote he wrote the preface let me show you the, the preface he became a very outstanding sociologist Paul Wasserfeld. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. So this is 1945. This is 1945. By, by that time, I was already teaching sociology. Mm -hmm. But something happened in between. Between these, these things take time. And as I was working on this, don't forget, I was in the institution. Mm -hmm. The war broke out. I got my degree in 41, 42. Mm -hmm. The war broke out, and I couldn't get a job in sociology. All the universities, the young men were going into the army, the professors were going to Washington, and the whole teaching business collapsed. And I was still in the institution. I had at least a roof over my head, mm -hmm. three meals a day. And I became, I was very friendly with a professor by the name of Willard Waller. Does that register? Yes. A sociologist. Yes. He did excellent work in the field of the family. Mm -hmm. I had taken a course with him at Columbia. And he, he badgered me all the time that I should do my dissertation on the institution. The, uh, the institution as a contained community. Mm -hmm the conflicts and the, uh, the problems that prevail when you have people living in. It was a, an institution with 800 kids, all in one building, one huge building. And um, about three dozen counselors. Were they uh, orphans, all orphans? Orphans in those days. But by the time I came back, they were putting orphans in, in um, uh, foster homes. Mm -hmm. These kids were pre-delinquent kids, mm -hmm. dependent and pre-delinquent kids, mm -hmm. and they were problem kids, and there was already a casework staff. They didn't have a casework staff when I was there, but they had a casework staff right on the premises working with these kids. Mm -hmm. And he was intrigued by that setup, Waller was, and he was working on a he was thinking of writing a book on organized groups. He was gathering uh, case studies. He had gathered a study of life in a prison, life in an army camp, life in a boarding school, life in a... Um, oh, he even had... A, 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 the, the refugees were coming in from Germany. He had one on, on uh, a concentration camp. And he wanted me to do a study of the institution, and he would put that all in a book. He would write a preface, a theoretical framework, and a conclusion. And when I was waiting, I was rewriting this and waiting for a job, I, had, I went up to see him, and I said to him, you look, you wanted me to write this thing, I'll write it for you. I've got nothing else to do. And I wrote, a, uh, I wrote a description of life in the institution. It ran about 50 pages. And we began working on it together. And one day I was in his office, and he shows me a telegram. And the telegram was from a man by the name of Gardner Cook on the faculty of the School of Social Work, 
at the University of Louisville, Kentucky, writing in behalf of the head of the Welfare Council, Council of Social Agencies of Louisville. They want to start a research program. Could he recommend somebody, a sociologist, to start the research program? And Waller sh shoves this telegram, and I said, I'm not interested. That's going to going to derail me. I want a teaching job. I want to be around here when a request comes in. Sooner or later, a request is going to come in. If everybody's going to go to Washington, there are going to be openings. And he said, look, take it. You're perfectly suited for it. You've got a good statistical background, a good sociology background, a good welfare background. Take it. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And you, when the war is over and uh, everything comes back to normal, I'll get you a job and you'll be worth a lot more than any kid coming out with a, 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 a new doctorate. So I took it. And I went to Louisville, Kentucky. And I was in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, as a uh, head of the one-man research department mm -hmm. of the uh, Louisville Council of Social Agencies, mm -hmm. with the research secretary. And I was there for two, three years. And it was a wonderful experience. It was just a marvelous experience. Uh, it was a tightly knit community, and the um, uh, uh, the elite of Louisville were very proud of their social agencies. They were involved in every phase of it. They were on the boards. And I became a, a sort of a luminary among them. Um, uh, uh, the studies that I did with committees, I, I always had to make presentations, public presentations. And I was, my name began to appear in the newspapers. It's a small town paper, you know. It began to appear in the newspapers regularly. I became a, a sort of a celebrity. And then I, I would go up to Cincinnati. Louisville is a dead town. Mm -hmm. In those days it was, anyway. And I used to go up to Cincinnati on weekends. It's not far away by train. Look up my old friends in Cincinnati, and my, my old mentor. My old mentor one day said to me, look, I'm losing another man going to Washington. I can't afford it. I need someone to teach sociology. Would you come and do it? Well, when a man like that asks you to do that, uh, and furthermore, I wanted to see whether I really would like teaching sociology after that wonderful experience in Louisville. And so I resigned my Louisville job, and I went up to Cincinnati, and I taught sociology for about two, three years, and it was boring. <laughs> it was boring, yeah. But um, it, uh, I realized that, I, uh, that there, uh, there is more to sociology than teaching social one courses to Well, I laugh to because girls. I uh, uh, taught sociology for one year, and I couldn't wait to quit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but sociology is really a very interesting field. Yes, I, as, I, a field. I, as a as a general field, and eventually I would have gone back to Lazarsfeld because he called me. He was setting up the Bureau of Applied Social Research at Columbia University, which became the first uh, um, uh, applied research center in the country. Then Michigan set up one and then other places set up one. But by that time, uh, as I, I'll show you, I was doing other things. When I went back to uh, Cincinnati and I taught sociology, the summers I spent at the, ju at the juvenile court. Um, I was in analysis at that time and I needed money. And there was uh, no summer school in uh, Cincinnati in those days. They just didn't have the money. But I was able to get a job at the juvenile court, my old job as a uh, probation officer, because during the summer, probation officers go off on vacation. And I renewed my acquaintance with uh, Ruth Jones, who was head of the ADC. 
And when I got tired of teaching sociology, she said to me one day, you know, schools of social work are opening up all over the country, and they are in desperate need for faculty. Why don't you try? I'll try to get you a fellowship at SSA. Try it for one year. You already know a great deal about the field. Try it. You can always go back to sociology. So she got me a uh, tuition scholarship, and they, uh, I went to SSA in 46. I, they assigned, uh, Helen Wright assigned me to um, become a research assistant to Alton Linford, mm -hmm. who was teaching the um, public assistance courses. But he didn't work me hard. He, he, he really uh, was very, very good to me. And uh, I, uh, my basic field work at SSA was uh, at Cook County Bureau of Public Welfare, mm -hmm. carrying an ADC load. Yeah, and uh, with a black, a black um, clientele. We didn't call them black in those days. In the Cottage Grove area, and my advanced field work was with Helen, with Lillian Ripple, at the research department of the. Um, uh, well, for a council. Mm -hmm. And instead of just staying one year, I stayed two years. They renewed my tuition fellowship, and uh, I got my, I got the degree. So I had a bachelor's, a master's in sociology, a doctorate in sociology, and a master's in social work. Mm -hmm. And then I read about California. And I, I had a miserable time every year, every winter in the Middle West, that terrible climate. I always used to say when winter came, this is the last winter I'm spending here. I'm going west. I didn't know what the west was, but I was going west. Well, finally, when I finished um, at SSA, I was at a crossroads. Now, which way do I go? F. Stuart Chapin at the University of Minnesota, by that time this thing came out, he reviewed it in the American Sociological Review, wrote me and offered me a job as uh, assistant professor in sociology teaching research courses. The University of Michigan wrote, Ted Newcomb, Theodore Newcomb, mm -hmm. offering me a job on the basis of this book. They were organizing their survey research center. The University of uh, uh, Reed College in Oregon offered me a job at just te teaching. And I was at a crossroads. I didn't know what to do. But I wa uh, there was something about social work research that um, drew me very, very intensely. And I had a friend in Los Angeles for whom I had done a study when I was a student at Columbia. He was with the uh, Jewish Welfare Board, National Jewish Welfare Board. His name was Meyer E. Fishman. <laughs> and by that time, Mickey was out on the West Coast setting up his uh, Jewish Centers Association. And I wrote him, and I said, I'd like to spend a little time to dry out. I was at the, at the student uh, infirmary practically every second week, getting drops and dows and so forth. And the doctors, the doctors said there, why don't you go to Arizona and dry out? So I wrote to Mickey and I said, I'd like to go to the West Coast just for a little while to dry out. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all happened. I first, I wrote to Mickey. Mickey had, no, Mickey had written to me and said, there's a man by the name of Ralph Beals at UCLA who's now putting together a social work program. Write to him. You've got exactly the background for, uh, for that. I wrote to Ralph Beals and he said, if you're ever out here, I'll talk to you. But right now, we only have a one-year program and that is, uh, we don't have room for research. That should come in the second year. Um. 
Don Howard hadn't yet come no, then. No, Don, Don came out because uh, Ralph Beals handed it over to Marge Drury. Oh, he didn't. Yes. He didn't. He was asked to do it, but he really was not uh, yes, not eager that. to do it. Yeah, yeah. he was not eager to do it. But I came out and I, I visited him, and before I wrote to him, I also wrote to Arlene Johnson. And Arlene wrote back and said, look, we don't have anything right now, but if you're ever out here, come out and, and visit with us. And so I had these possibilities. And in addition, the Jewish Welfare Federation was beginning a study of the needs of the aged, the Jewish aged in Los Angeles. And Mickey thought that, Mickey Fishman thought that maybe I could head that study, but I couldn't get out there. Uh, early enough. Uh, I wanted to finish my work at, and get the degree. I, I couldn't get there early enough. Uh, so I had these possibilities. Arlene Johnson, uh, Beals, and I had read in a magazine called The Community a, a report that Jen Carter had given at the at the uh, uh, national, what do you call it, the welfare uh, the conference on uh, the national conference, con the national social conference on social yes, work. National conference it, on it, social welfare. It was it was in San Francisco in 1947, mm -hmm. yes. and she had given a paper, and uh, the um, the methodology uh, intrigued me, and I I just sat down and wrote her a letter. And I said that I'm going to be out here, and I read this article of yours, and I'm intrigued about the methodology, and I'd like to drop in and, and um, talk to you if and when I'm out here. And she wrote back like, a very nice letter. I still have it. still have the letter. And uh, so I had these prospects. I came out and uh, landed at the YMCA on... What is it, Figueroa Street? Figueroa yeah. Street. And I was there. Uh, that was my headquarters. And I went out and visited Mickey, visited Beals, visited uh, Arlene, visited uh, um, yeah. Jen. Yeah. And I could see that Arlene was sizing me up. I had a very long talk with Arlene. Very, she was a very bright woman. And she said, you know, what you need, true, you've got a good background, but what you need is a little more experience in research before you go out and, and test your wings as a research, as a teacher of research. It's true you did research at, at the Louisville Council, but you need a little bit more experience. I'm going to send you to see Genevieve Carter. I said, I... Uh, she's on my list. Mm -hmm. She said, I'll talk, I'll telephone her. You go down there. And they were very her. close friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to run out of uh, tape. I'm watching. Go ahead, Big Lots. More? There's more? I'm coming to the end. No, I'm that's all right. I've got lots of tapes. Oh. This one can be turned over, and then I have two more. And I went to see Jen, and we had a very nice talk. And uh, as I walk into the office, those offices there had um, had um, window, you know, glass yes. partitions. And in the next office, I see a woman who's very familiar to me. And it turned out to be Helen Dean. Mm -hmm. Remember Helen mm -hmm. Dean? Oh, yes. When I was at the Welfare Council in Louisville, I went to a number of national conferences called by the Children's Bureau, and I met Helen Dean there. And I said to Jen, I know that woman. Jen said, well, we'll call her in. So we had a three-way conversation, and Dean wanted to know what I was doing there. And I told her, I'm looking for a job. And that, that ended it. It's interesting because at lunch today with Jim Leiby, we were talking about Helen Dean, who had <laughs> written 
and we found not long ago an unpublished document of, about the history of social agencies in Los Angeles until 1925, which we were planning to put out as a monograph. She wrote that when? She wrote it while she was, uh, she wrote it in 1930. In 1930. Mm -hmm. And then I got a telephone call at the YMCA to come up. Helen Dean had an idea that she had, she said she had collected an enormous amount of material and she wanted the, t the time to write. She needed a job. So she cannot, she could not give up the entire job, but she would go on half time. And that I would fill in her the other half time. And would I do it? And I said, sure, I'll do it. Just like that? Just like that. Well, I had no, I had no you know, when I went out to Los Angeles, I went out on borrowed money. Mm -hmm. I borrowed $500 from a friend of mine a, um, uh, a friend in Cincinnati, a dentist, who had done my teeth when I was a poor student and did it for nothing. And we became very, very good friends. And um, he loaned me $500. He said, I wish I could go with you. And it was on that $500 that I was living on. Uh, I used to eat, what is that great cafeteria on Union Square? That crazy cafeteria, everybody? Pantry? No, uh, it was a big cafeteria. Uh, yeah, oh, Clifton. Cl Clifton. Uh, Clifton, yeah. He fed the homeless. Uh-huh, yeah. And I had a little room, Mickey Fishman got me a little room on uh, right off Los Feliz Boulevard with a family. And uh, that's where I began. Mm -hmm. And I was there for about, uh, Oh, a month. I had to put out trends. That was their publication. And I had to set up uh, standard family budgets because agencies would call in and want to know uh, uh, what we recommended for assistance. And then um, the uh, city of Long Beach wanted to have a study done on the recreational needs of the city. And they called on Bradley Buell and Associates, or Sorensen, something like that. You remember? Yes, Community I do. Community research. Bradley uh, uh -huh. Buell did a lot of these kinds of studies. He went out. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But he'd go out and set up the study, but he didn't... Didn't do it himself. Didn't do it there. And he needed staff. And Jen loaned me mm -hmm. to Buell for six months. This was when, 1947? No, this was already 48. 48. 48, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they liked what I did. And by that time, Dean quit. There, something happened there. Helen Dean quit. There was some sort of a blow-up, a bust-up, or, or, or uh, Pfeiffer. Uh, uh, Pfeiffer had a... Uh, Big Pfeiffer. Big Pfeiffer, yeah, had a... Had a uh, some sort of a conflict with her. So a, an opening opened up for me. And that's how I began as a research associate. And from research associate, I became assistant director. And I was there for, I don't know, four or five years. And then an opening uh, for research, uh, for teaching opened up at the University of Pittsburgh under Neustadter. Mm -hmm. And he offered it to me. And I, I went to Jen and I said, what do you think I should do? Oh, he said, yeah. Jen said, you really should take it. He said, you've outgrown this. You've outgrown it. And this, but had Jen known that she would leave, move on, she probably would have yeah, groomed me for the... Yeah, she didn't know that uh, yeah. in advance. No, no. And, uh, and uh, I also became friendly with Marge Drury. I used to go up there and deliver a lecture every now and then her in her research course. And I became acquainted with Don Howard. And Don Howard hired Helen Whitmer. Helen Whitmer went off on, on leave for one year, and Don Howard hired me as an acting researcher. 
and I taught one course and supervised uh, 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 the, in those days they had theses mm -hmm. and I had a notion that uh, Helen that Helen Whitmer would not come back and that Don would hire me but we negotiated and we talked and uh, in the end uh, Don said you better take the Pittsburgh job it's uh, I, I apparently Don wanted to fill that position with a high caliber name he wanted to fill all his positions with big names and uh, so I, I, I lost that opening. But it was very good that I went to uh, Pittsburgh because one of the students whom I supervised in her doctoral dissertation was on the faculty here at Berkeley. We didn't have a doctoral program in those days. She went to the University of Pittsburgh. The University of Pittsburgh had an arrangement with uh, the Menninger Clinic. You did your field work there and you did your... Uh, uh, your uh, classroom work at, uh, at Pittsburgh and she was the one who recommended me to Chernin and that's how I came out here. And that was when? Uh, I came out in 53. 53. Mm -hmm. So that's the story of my life. Mm -hmm. Well not quite the story of your life, just certain highlights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did, I, did I cover everything? Well, you, cover, you covered a lot very succinctly and interestingly. Mm -hmm. uh, when you came to uh, Berkeley, what was your assignment? When I came to Berkeley, the senior man who was ahead of me was a man by the name of Davis McIntyre. And he was an economist. And Chernin had hired him on the economics department, no, the Institute of Industrial Research, Industrial Relations, which was then headed by a man named Clark Kerr, who be later became chancellor. And Davis was promised by Chernin that he could go to Europe, Italy, for his first sabbatical and Chernin needed a researcher very badly because he was not going to break his promise to McIntyre. McIntyre was a very important man to Chernin because then Kerr became chancellor and Chernin had a direct line to the chancellor's office through McIntyre. Because McIntyre was the only one who called Clark Kerr Clark. <laughs> And Shannon was very eager to have somebody. Uh, McIntyre, as I said, was really an economist. Uh, but he was very much interested in land reform. And he went to Italy to study land reform. So I took over all of his courses. The arrangement here was you teach a basic course in research in the first year. They divided the class, the entering class, into two sections. I taught one section the first semester, the second section the second semester. A basic formal course. What is research? And what is its role in social welfare? And how does it differ from sociological research? And what can you do and what you cannot do mm -hmm. because of the nature of your data? And the second year you carried, by that time they had group research projects instead of theses here. Uh, the theses became outmoded. It was just too much. What's that? No, that just tells me it's someone is running out. So let me just stop this tape. By all means, let me get and, a drink of water. Okay. This is continuing the interview with Ernest Greenwood. This is side B of cassette number one. Yeah. What is it? So now we have you at Berkeley. So now I am teaching the basic course in research, which I, I really enjoyed. I even wrote a little syllabus 
Are you familiar with that syllabus that I wrote for my basic course? I'd like to see it. Oh, let's see if I can find it. Lectures and Research Methodology for Social Welfare Students. And this reprinted three times after well, the Well, you know, I, I, I used it. When, it, when the supply ran out, we would run up another. It was the University of California Press did it. Mm -hmm. yeah, just very, very simple. Mm -hmm. But it's impressive and comprehensive. They still use it. No. Other people have other agendas. But the basics have not changed. Yeah, they, we have a new crop. Mm -hmm. They don't, uh, this is, there's a good bit of philosophy here, the philosophy of, of research. Mm -hmm. And um, what is theory? What is a concept? What is an hypothesis? What is measurement? What do you do when you really measure? When can you measure and when can you not measure? Um, what is proof? What is validity? What is reliability? And um, uh, it was, it was ha highly philosophical, but the students liked it. I would think so, because mm -hmm. it gives them a very good basis mm -hmm. for branching off in any direction they want to. They mm -hmm. have the essentials. They don't like techniques of that. Mm -hmm. uh, practitioners don't need it, don't use it. No, there's, uh, uh, I think the teaching of research has become uh, highly um, quantitative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I saved that from my doctoral level, of course. That's, that's a different thing. Yeah. 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 And, and, and my second, the second, my, uh, my duties for the second year were to, uh, and I, I, this was concurrent. And uh, I taught in the first year, I taught in the second year. In the second year, I carried two group research projects of about 10 students each and, and supervised the faculty because we had something like seven faculty members carrying research projects. And someone had to coordinate it, mm -hmm. systematize it, make it uniform so students um, students had to have a tendency of competing with one another for faculty, especially if the mode of instruction is very varied. But if it's uniform, uh, the students are satisfied with mm -hmm. whomever they're, uh, they're assigned. And I had to see to it that every year we had enough uh, projects to accommodate all second year students. So that was my job, mm -hmm. uh, both teaching and uh, a certain amount of, of, of administration. And when McIntyre came back, uh, I continued to do this because McIntyre developed other interests. Mm -hmm. He was wrangling for a, a joint appointment with the Giannini outfit. Because the Bank in, of America? No, 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 uh, the, uh, the school, what do you, uh, they call it, the Giannini... Uh, a school of, um, of agricultural economics. Oh, agricultural economics, yeah. And he, he eventually got that dual appointment. Did that move to uh, Davis, or was that a different No, no, one? it's still, it's it's still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So his, uh, his duties were shifted. When we began the doctoral program, his duties were shifted into the mm -hmm. doctoral program. He practically abandoned the master's level um, teaching and supervise dissertations mm -hmm. and so forth. Well then, as you continued uh, at Berkeley, did you always uh, concentrate on teaching in the research arena? Things have changed. If I had remained after my retirement, today you don't do that. Mm -hmm. You have to teach substantive uh, courses. And if I had, I, what I would have what I would have done would be to teach a course in the history of social work as a profession. Mm 
the professionalization of social work, how that came about, mm -hmm. and what obstacles were encountered. And um, uh, social work as a profession, I would have taught a course, in, an advanced course in mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. on a doctoral level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you uh, stop teaching? I stopped teaching. I was at Berkeley for 20 years. I stopped teaching in uh, 72 or 73. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What have you been doing since? Oh, what have I been doing since? Well, the first thing that I did was, you know, I spent a year and a half in Chile teaching at the University of Chile. Did you know that? No. No. See that? Oh, yes. It's too good. Say it for the tape. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I taught at the University of Chile at the Instituto de Servicio Social, Universidad de Chile, in the, um, in the Facultad de Ciencias Juridicas y Sociales. And um, I took the lectures, and I got a grant from the Institute of Latin American Studies. And I hired a student, a Chilean student, who was getting his doctorate here at, in the sociology department. In those days, we had a Chile, California convenio program, exchange program. Mm -hmm. I went down there on that exchange program, and these students would come up here, get their doctorates here. And this is a very interesting development. And he helped me to put my lectures. I delivered those lectures in Spanish mm -hmm. with my very, very poor Spanish. It just sounded fluent. Yeah, well, I, I put up a good front. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, he had a hard time. Well, he had a, he was paid for it, uh, putting those lectures into a publishable form. Mm -hmm. And he also improved it. He also added a lot of uh, good material. And I had that published. Let's see if I could find it. By a an Argentinian publishing house. Metodologia de la Investigación. Is that mm -hmm. how you say it? Well, the uh, Investigación is, is research. That's what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ernie, do you have a, a list of your publications? Yes. One that I can have? Or if you have it, I'll, I'll copy it and return it well, to you. Well, no. What I'll do is I'll, I'll mail it to you. All right. Yeah, I'll mail it to you. Somewhere. I have it somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... I see various other Yeah, the others all. were, yeah, in that same yeah. series, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the man who helped me, incidentally, this, this is now used in, in, uh, in Chile as a, the man who helped me do this, a sociologist, was a man by the name of Germán Correa Díaz, Díaz, mm -hmm. Germán Correa Díaz. Now, mind you, this is about 20 years ago. Herman Correa Diaz today is Minister of the Interior of the new Eduardo Frey government of Chile. You were dealing with very august people. Yes, <laughs> uh -huh. Made in USA. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen him reported in the Los Angeles Times recently. Too. You mean the Ed Eduardo Frey, yes. the new president? Yes. He is the son of the president that I knew. Uh -huh. I met uh, the old man when I was teaching there. He was a very approachable man. I mean, he he was. Uh, you'd find him at meetings and conferences and cocktail parties and yeah so um, um, yeah I just 
uh, I just got a letter from a letter from him. Mm -hmm. When he was a student here, his son was born here. He was here for about four or five years. Now his son is 25 years old or something and wants to come to Berkeley uh, to st get a doctorate. And he, uh, Correa uh, wrote to me and said that um, he's that uh, his son is coming to work. <laughs> What's he wanted in, in economics? I don't know. He doesn't say. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. um, he doesn't say. So that's one thing I did. Then another thing I did was I had a student, one of my doctoral students, who um, became interested in, uh, in um, uh, administrative research. Um, policy-oriented research, and taught for a number of years at the University of North Carolina in the deep, in the school of uh, urban, um, uh, what do they call it today? City and regional planning. Mm -hmm. And he used the outline that I always gave to students uh, who were planning their doctoral dissertations, I used an outline. And he used that outline in his basic course in research, but applying it to administrative or policy-oriented research. And he once sent me an outline of a book that he wanted to write using that framework, but applying it to policy-oriented research. And I encouraged him to do that. And midway in the book, in writing, he got stuck. And he asked me if I would collaborate with him. And this is the book that culminated with that. Robert Mayer and Ernest Greenwood. And this one was, I'm looking for a date, 1980. Mm -hmm. When you send me your list, I will look Oh, yeah, this will look there. This has been translated into Indonesian. Indonesian. Now, this book, the first book of mine, mm -hmm. was translated into Spanish and into German. I still have the Spanish translation. I think that's great to, to spread your influence so far. It's because of this that I was invited by the Chileans. They knew they used mm -hmm. this in Chile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing I did was this. You know, many years ago, as part of the group research project that I ran, what emerged from one of those projects was a paper on the professions. Remember, attributes of a profession. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that has received a lot of a, a mm -hmm. lot of uh, recognition, quoted in, uh, in uh, footnotes, and and I wrote a uh, a kind of a uh, an update of it, a revision of it. Who did you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think that was a classic. Yeah, it was a good, good yes. paper. It was a good paper. That, that was, has been reprinted in many, 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 many publications. It was reprinted in this. Mm -hmm. That's our, our two boys. At oh, yes. Uh -huh. Neil Gilbert and Harry Specht. And let's see if I can find it. Bogart, remember Bogartus? Of course. He, he edited I that journal and he, uh, he asked me to do that. Mm -hmm. 
They're still publishing this at USC. That's wonderful. Uh -huh. That's great. This was it. This was attributes of a profession. And where the devil is that? This is the original. That was the original. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the follow-up. Attributes of a profession revisited. Um, oh, this, this is... Um, Oh, oh the, the, this, this, this appeared. By, uh, yeah, this Gilbert appeared. In the but where did this other one appear? The original attributes. Of oh, it, it appeared in social work. Oh, in the NESW. Yeah, NESW. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this appeared in the second edition of this book. This it's not in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then when I got through with all of that, I started to work on the history of my family. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've done so far. Yeah, I'd like to. Did you know any of them? The grandparents? The Some of them I knew. The others I got from talking to people. And then uh, do you make copies of this available? Every member of my family gets one of gets these. One. When I finish chapter by chapter, oh, I, I see. make 12 copies and I send it out. At what point are you now? I am, uh, this is volume two. This is the history of my parents. Mm -hmm. I am now at the point where my father is ready to get married. Let me, let me show you what he looked like. You have a strong resemblance no, to no. him. Mm -hmm. 1906. Uh, and he, they, they came uh, in 1921. 21. Mm -hmm. well, this, well, so this is all about the, the European mm -hmm. uh, phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have you started the oh, yeah. American well, phase? Not yet. I have one, one more chapter to do when they get married. Mm -hmm. And then a, the war breaks out, the War of 1914, mm -hmm. and that ends the Halcyon days. He's drafted into the army. He, he uh, before that he is a a uh, he was trained as a is that, uh, drafted into uh, Austro-Hungarian Austro army. Yeah. He was trained as a um, as a custom tailor, mm -hmm. and instead of uh, uh, doing custom tailoring, he opened up a business selling materials to custom tailors. Because the the Euro in those days the European m method was you didn't buy uh, a, a well-to-do man or a middle-class man didn't buy a ready-made clothes. Mm -hmm. He had it had it custom made. Ready-made clothes in those days were of very poor quality. So he opened up a, a business where he uh, sold materials to other tailors, and he did very well. We had a very nice life, nice, typical, uh, uh, antebellum, mm -hmm. middle-class European life. And then came the war. And he was drafted. He was a young man. And he spent the last two years of the war in the uh, Austro-Hungarian army. He was the, not yet married. Oh, yes. He oh, was he already, was already yeah, married. He had a, yeah, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, and you had been born already. Sure, oh, sure. I was born in 1910. Sure. Magda was born in 1912 or 13. Olga, the other sister, was born. And so the three children were already born. Mm -hmm. before he went into the army. But that's, that period soured him on uh, European life. And after the war, the economic conditions were very, very bad. And then there was a wave of anti-Semitism. 
and the, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is a large landlocked empire, was broken up by the Allies, and little countries were created from it. Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Transylvania was given to Romania, and Austria was left just a little, little country. And Transylvania became Romanian, and the Romanians are notoriously anti-Semitic. And he couldn't, he couldn't stomach this. And that's why he, he, mm -hmm. he came to the United States. So I've got to write the uh, period where he gets married, we're born, and uh, we have this very brief, nice existence, and then he's uh, drafted, he comes back from the army, and um, the Romanians, when they moved into Transylvania and took it over, were very vindictive of the Hungarians because the Hungarians, previous to the war, used to mistreat the Romanians who, who lived in Transylvania. Very reminiscent yeah. of today, isn't mm -hmm. it? And so uh, my father won uh, violated a curfew one day. They had a curfew, and they dragged him in, and he got uh, five lashes on his body. It wasn't, it mm -hmm. wasn't uh, the way this guy is going to get it in <laughs> Singapore. Singapore. But it soured him on Europe. The whole, the whole situation soured him. So that's why he came to America. And I've got to write that period. Now, where do you get your uh, material? Uh, had you known the, your grandparents and parents well enough to get this information from them? Well, we well, see when my mother died, and I acquired a new set, a new mother, and a new set of grandparents. They were here in this country, mm -hmm. and I grew up with them. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I knew the whole family. I knew their background. I used to listen to stories that were, were told, and, mm -hmm. and so. But my father, um, uh, when he came to this country, uh, he resorted back to tailoring. And tailoring is a very strange occupation. He had tailor stores in New York and for a while in Passaic, New Jersey. Um, a tailor can do his work and talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, as his fingers move deftly over the garment, I would sit and listen to him reminisce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was always a note-taker. Note Always, always a note taker. Ever since I was a kid. So you have notes. I have notes. No wonder you became a researcher. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have notes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when um, Magda and Algo married Chileans, see these Chileans came up to the United States on on business, and they met the girls and they married them and took them down there. And uh, they kept asking. They kept writing back saying that if my father went down to Chile, he could do very well opening up a factory making ladies' garments because there, was, there were no factories in the late 1930s in Chile making, uh, producing garments, mass producing garments. Mm -hmm. And he learned this mass production while working in the garment industry in New York and in New Jersey. And he had a very good organizational mind. And he decided that he was going to try his luck down there. And in 1939, he went down just before the war broke out. If he'd waited a couple of more months, he would not have been able to go. And he went down there. And I, had a, I was at Columbia then getting my doctorate. And I had a feeling that I would never see him again. I don't know why I had that feeling, but I had this picture of immigrants leaving Europe and never going back and never seeing their relatives. And I said to my father, I said, Papa, you've told me so much about yourself. Would you be willing to sit down and tell him the whole thing all over again so I could write it down? I didn't have a tape recorder such as you have. Yeah. And he said, all right, I will do it as soon as I could liquidate my business, 
buy the ticket, pack up everything, and he had a couple of weeks left over, well, maybe about a month before. In those days, you went by ship. Yeah. And uh, you had a book months ahead of time. And he had about a month left over. He had nothing to do. And I would come out from Columbia. I was already in the institution every weekend. And during the week, if I could get time off, and we would sit at the kitchen table in our home and per se. And I said, begin from the beginning, Papa. And he started talking. And he talked and he talked. And when, uh, when he was through, I had 50 pages of foolscap, yellow, yellow full, on both sides, mm -hmm. um, two lines to a space mm -hmm. uh, of uh, notes. And that's what I'm using. Mm -hmm. Well, that's marvelous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when he died, he remained in Chile. He did very well in Chile. Mm -hmm. they, uh, and did you see him again? Oh, I used to see him often. Well, I sure. thought probably. Sure. So. And it just happened that my first sabbatical here was uh, the year that he uh, uh, contracted uh, lung cancer. He was a heavy smoker. He was a very heavy smoker. And uh, I went out to Chile, and I was there for about three months, and uh, I was there when he died. Mm -hmm. And I said Kaddish at his beer. And when he died, my stepmother and I were going through his belongings, and we discovered in the corner of his, the closet, she didn't even know it was there, a large uh, package wrapped in, uh, in blue paper and a, a red uh, ribbon. And we, op we nudged each other to open it up, and we opened it up. And there were pictures, family pictures, going back to his, that's where I got that picture from. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And induction papers into the army, and vaccination certificates from me, and marriage license with my first mother, everything. So I've, I've got it all. And that's marvelous. I've got it all. Yeah. Now I am going to take a picture of you. Is that all right? Sure. Before I take your picture, tell me about your special things at Berkeley. Well, one of the reasons that Chernin was collecting this, this interdisciplinary faculty of his. You keep talking. Yeah. Is there enough light? Is hmm? Enough light? Oh, there's enough light mm -hmm. for me. Uh -huh. Well, one of the, one of the uh, reasons that he was collecting this interdisciplinary faculty, I came from sociology, McIntyre came from economics, he came from political science, he got another man from anthropology, um, you remember Henry Moss? Oh, of course. Yeah. Well, Henry came from uh, human development at Chicago. You remember Gordon Hearn? Yes. He came from group dynamics. Because his idea of a doctoral program was it, that would, it would be grounded in the social sciences. Mm -hmm. That was a new concept in those yes. days, you know? Very, very forward-looking. And I wasn't here more than two months when he said, I'm setting up a committee headed by Henry Moss. I want you on it. I want Gordon Hearn on it, a couple, uh, a couple of others. And I want you to lay the basis for uh, the, the outlines of a doctoral program. And we worked on that program for, uh, oh, for about six or seven years. When McIntyre came back, he sat on it. Henry then uh, had to leave because he wanted to do this study on um, uh, children in need of parents. And I took it over, and we designed a doctoral program which was turned down by the um, Graduate Council. 
Why? Because it's too interdisciplinary. No, no. They they approved. They they felt it was a very good very good program, but they didn't like the idea that an applied discipline should have a Ph.D. They said, "We'll give it to you, provided you have you uh, you take a D.S.W." So we accepted a DS. What they actually did was this. The, the School of Education here at, at Berkeley has two programs, two doctoral programs, a PhD program and an EDD program. The PhD program, as you probably know, is much more theory, research oriented, and the other is more applied, more administrative, that sort of thing. That's what they wanted us to introduce. They, they felt that the PhD, the purity of the PhD, should be somehow protected. And it would be protected if, if side by side there was another doctoral program, uh, which would be a professional program rather than a, uh, than a, a doctor of philosophy. So they asked us to, they really asked us to, um, they said they would, we would grant you this program provided you have two programs or you will accept only a DSW. They wouldn't get it. And we didn't want two programs. We felt that sooner or later when you have two programs, one of the programs becomes a bargain basement program. Mm -hmm. That you're going to shunt the questionable students into that program and rather than and rather than in the other program. So we accepted a DSW, and we had a DSW for 20 years. And then uh, when Chernin left, maybe 25 years, the new dean reapplied. And the whole uh, atmosphere had changed in the interim. We had demonstrated that our that our graduates were first-rate graduates, that our dissertations were very well performed, and now the, uh, the university has given us a PhD. And if I remember correctly, they converted all the DSWs to PhDs. PhDs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, 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 uh, I did a lot of work on that because I was the only one um, on the committee consistently. The others would come on for a year, they had other commitments, they, 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 they'd come back. Uh, Gordon Hurd went up to Toronto to teach for a year and then could come back. But I was the only one who was always with the program and uh, I feel pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think yeah. you should because mm -hmm. some very good people have been have to come, come out of that, that program. program. Mm -hmm. And when we started that program, then I was hoping that McIntyre, being my senior, would teach the doctoral level course in that program. And he would let me take over the master's program entirely. But it was not to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chernin wanted him to teach the courses in administration because his his, um, he has two master's degrees, one in economics and one from Harvard in administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chernin felt that he would, he's the logical person to teach that course. So I had to teach the doctoral level mm -hmm. course in, uh, in research, for which I'm not sorry, because I, I, think, I think I produced a pretty good course. Mm -hmm. I would think so. McBroom took that course. Yes, I yeah, know. Betty McBroom took that mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. And really, that it's from that course that that you know that book evolved. Mayor, the Mayor Greenwood book, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. evolved from that course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's about all. Well, now uh, yeah. I th I thank you very much, and you're going to send me your list. I'm going to of send you a oh, the list of publications. And if you find anything else that you think might be of interest. Uh, to us. Like what? Well, uh, if you have any uh, copies of old publications, extra copies. 
Oh, I uh, see. That can go into our archives, archives and scholars can use them. We do have a lot of uh, queries about uh, papers that are no longer in print. Uh -huh. And especially research uh, papers. So anything you come across, like mm -hmm. these pictures you came across, which have a personal correspondence, I'm not a correspondence. Right. Yes, if it sheds some light on uh, what um, the development of social guess, work or uh -huh. social work education was at the time. Yes, anything that gives us insights into the kinds of problems in the community, as well as answers, problems in education, social work education, mm -hmm. any of those things. All of the studies that I did at the Welfare Council, I have copies, I have copies of every study. I gave them all to Libby for the archives here. Oh, okay. And he and Ruth are checking this afternoon. Every, uh, every what each everything one, that uh, I has. had, I gave to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's fine because uh, we're working out a system. I don't have to record this. Mm -hmm. We're working out a concludes the interview with Dr. Ernest Greenwood. Uh, he will be sending for our archives and connect and association with this uh, recording uh, his uh, curriculum vitae and also some other things that he believes he will uh, be able to locate that might cast some light on the history of social welfare in the Los Angeles area.